Tony Leon led the parliamentary opposition in South Africa for 13 years before being appointed ambassador to Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay, a post he held until 2011. Since then, he's been uh, lecturing, writing and consulting, and he is currently in Israel to give a series of lectures at the IDC in Herzliya. I-24 News editor Jeff Abramowitz caught up with him, and here's the talk. Tony Leon, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed by I-24 News. Thank you. I'd like to start, if I can, with Israel and South Africa, two countries which were once allies, close friends, and now they are enemies. Well, if not enemies, the close relationship has certainly gone, possibly never to return. What do you think caused the change? I think some of the change was historical. First of all, the apartheid government and the Israeli government and the South African Defense Force and the Israeli Defense Force did indeed collaborate uh, out of necessity. They were both, to an extent, pariah countries in the world community, and they had some mutual interests at the time. And that's had a hangover after the abandonment of apartheid into the democratic South Africa. I, I think that was leavened or lessened during the presidency of Nelson Mandela. Because while Nelson Mandela and the ANC, which obviously still governs South Africa, had intense bonds and bands of solidarity with the Palestinian cause and the PLO in particular at the time, of course, Hamas did not exist when South Africa became a democracy in any meaningful way. Um, that still, because I think of Mandela's own personality and his close relationship with the members of the South African Jewish community, tended to be... Uh, lessened perhaps by quite strong feelings between Israel and South Africa, officially and unofficially. Now, Zuma and the current government tend to be much less internationally minded, and to the extent that they are internationally minded, they have a very narrow view of what you might call internationalism. It tends to be what used to be called in the old terms third world solidarity politics. Mm -hmm. It tends to be South Africa to some extent adopting an anti-Western posture. And, and perhaps I could interrupt here and say that a bit like Taiwan in Southeast Asia, Israel in the Middle East is seen by many as being a proxy for the United States. So if you have a, to some extent, an anti-American bias or sentiment, you'll almost reflexively be quite hostile to Israel. Of course, it's been accentuated because of recent developments, and this would include the fact that I think Israel, in turn, has basically got much less interest in South Africa than it might have had 20 years ago. So they've kind of, they don't invest that much in the relationship. But on the other hand, there is an embassy in both countries. Certainly the Israeli ambassador in South Africa is very active. I think it's not the easiest job in world diplomacy. Let's maybe take a simplistic view. Is it payback for all the help Israel gave the apartheid regime? I think that is part of the uh, background. I think the other part of the background is the, uh, some kind of political calculation. So I, I think a lot of it's not just about the South Africa-Israel position. It's also about the international uh, alignments that tend still to be a hangover from the Cold War. I mean, I'm very struck by the fact not only do people like Mandela say to me when he was president and I was the leader of the opposition, you know, the, the Arab countries were on our side, which I think they were, broadly speaking, but also that they regarded really the Cold War, one side America, the other side the yeah. Soviet Union, as being a dividing ground that's continued into uh, the new politics. And I, I think there's a lot of hangover from that still to this day. What can be done to get the relationship back on track? Well, you know, I, I think one must actually be quite modest about it. And, and I think that is the Israeli uh, embassy's approach. You've got to say, well, what are the points of interest and intersection? You're not going to change the mind of the South African government from where it is, which I think is rather unreflective. I don't think it's a very nuanced position. I think it's a rather crude position that you know, Palestinians are right and subject to injustice and Israel's wrong and is the colonial overlord. And it, it almost feeds into a frame of 
of rather superficial similarities. There are obviously some similarities between oppressed people everywhere in the world, and objectively, I think Palestinians are pretty oppressed in, under occupation. But that doesn't mean that chapter and verse, the story of apartheid, it's the story of Palestinians in the West Bank. But there's a, a, a tendency, because it's simpler, to make the one narrative fit the other. You're not going to change that, whether it's inaccurate, ahistorical, or whatever. If you look at the government-to-government -government relationship, it's pretty dreary and dull and predictable and rather unimaginative. I think if you look beyond that, I think there is a lot of uh, growth areas and there's a lot that can be done. Which brings me, in a roundabout way, to the next topic. You lived through and con made a major contribution to the resolution of a conflict many of us thought would never be solved. I know of one person who left South Africa in 1979 because he said apartheid will never end in my you, life. You, and you were not alone, a lot of people. Um, I mean, it was resolved in the most miraculous way. It, what advice would you give to Israelis and Palestinians? Because we stuck in many ways in the same situation, a conflict people think can never be solved. It is interesting how countries which seem stuck in the most dire and terrible situations can transcend through various leaps of the imagination and very strong and good leadership, uh, their condition and become something else. And, you know, I'm not going to suggest once again that I can give you a prescription or a menu and say, do these five things and you know, peace will come to pass for now and forevermore. It doesn't work like that. But if I was to extrapolate just some themes from that South African transition, you certainly need bold leadership on both sides. I would prosecute, if I was an Israel, I'm not so, forgive me being presumptuous, but you asked a question, I would go hell for leather for two-state solution while it's still on the table. Mm -hmm. Because I pick up a lot of chatter just from the other side, to the extent I'm exposed to it, that a lot of Palestinians with long-term vision say, we'll just sit it out. Right. And then it'll be a one-state solution because the demographics are on our side. And therefore, while that option, because, you know, options on the table today aren't necessarily options on the table in a few years' time. If you were Benjamin Netanyahu, what would you say to Mahmoud Abbas? I would say, when can we talk and let's have a meaningful discussion, put everything on the table. But I'm not Benjamin Netanyahu, I doubt that he'll say that. And if you were Mahmoud Abbas, what would you say to Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, I wouldn't say what, in fact, Saeed Erekat said the other day in New York when I was there. He said, well, you know, our problem is there's no Israeli to clerk. That was actually the headline of an right, article he wrote in the Wall Street that. Journal. And um, I, I wouldn't say that. I'd say I have to deal with the people who I have to deal with. I can't hope for some situation. Uh, I'm going to have to make some concessions, and, but I'm going to take a deal. As I say, while the two-state solution is still on the table, I would really go all guns blazing, forgive the metaphor, to make it happen. Tony Leon, thank you very much for your time and for your insight. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Appreciate that.